This election is kicking into gear. We are now entering March, Feb, where the campaigns will really start revving up. And we have a lot to discuss. The Sona address, Dinzualo, Stage 6, and recent election polls. Let's get into it. Welcome back to SMWX. One of the biggest elections in South Africa's democratic history is potentially just months away, although as we shoot, we still don't have a date. We were hoping we would get one at Sona, but let's see. Apparently in the next few days, we're going to get an election date. Today, I want to just give you a roundup of the election as we've been doing regularly, and we'll continue to do these and make them more regular as we get closer and closer to the 2024 election. So today I want to talk about three things. First, President Cyril Ramaphosa's State of the Nation address and the story of Dinzualo. Secondly, we're going to talk about stage six load shedding, which is a bombshell which I think has major implications for this election. And then finally, we've been tracking polls. Ipsos put out a recent poll and I want to give some thoughts on the implications of the recent Ipsos poll, and we can see where the different political parties are sitting as of December last year, which was when this poll came to a close. All right, so let's start off with the State of the Nation address. Now, in any election year, the SONA before the election is a really important moment in any election. Why is that? That's because you start to see the ANC's campaign message taking shape in the SONA. It's a great opportunity on primetime TV to address the nation and really get your message across and uninterrupted this year, we might add. So what exactly was the message that President Cyril Ramaphosa was trying to get across? Well, I must say, if you look at our previous election update, we called this on SMWX because it's very clear that the ANC has a very interesting strategy in this election. They are not going to make this election about what has happened in the last five years. They are seeking to frame this election around the last 30 years and especially South Africa since 1994. Now what does this tell you? Well, what it tells you is that the last five years are a difficult message for the ANC and they're trying to find ways of reworking the narrative and the message of the campaign to put them on a good trajectory. And the best way to do that is to say, well, okay, we're not going to talk much about the last five years because things have got worse on a whole host of issues, whether you talk about energy, unemployment, whether you talk about uh, the state of the economy, inequality. But when you make it about a longer period from 1994, well, then apartheid and that crime against humanity becomes the bar. And then you can say life has got be- gotten better for people since apartheid over the last 30 years. So, okay, even though the last five years might have been difficult, the last 30 years still represent something of a success. Now, President Ramaphosa framed his entire speech Really, it wasn't a SONA, if you ask me. It wasn't a state of the nation. What is the state of South Africa right now? It was a review of 30 years of democracy. Now, in some ways, it's a clever campaign ploy because it reworks the framing of the election and it changes the debate. So now you could see people in the media fell for this framing. They started talking about, well, is 30 years, you know, have we made progress? How much progress have we made? But the fact of the matter is we've already had lots of elections which have rewarded the ANC for everything that's happened before 2019, right? That's the whole reason why we had the 1999 election, the 2004 election, the 2009 and 2014 election and 2019 election. So we have already, as a society, as a country, rewarded the ANC for all the gains that have been made since 1994. What this election has to be about is not 30 years, because we are not voting for the first time after 30 years. It has to be, since the last election, have things got better? And the ANC doesn't want to have that conversation because they know that's a much harder conversation 
than is your life better over the past 30 years? So how did President Ramaphosa try to frame this 30-year message of life getting better since 1994? Which it has. There's no doubt about that. Democracy is better than apartheid. That's fairly obvious. But what about the last five years? Well, President Ramaphosa came up once again with one of the most interesting and innovative strategies to try and paint this picture of progress over the last 30 years, the story of Dinzualo. The story of the first 30 years of our democracy can best be told through a number of initiatives that have been embarked upon in the 30 years. But I think that the story can best be told through the life of a child who was born at the dawn of our democracy called Tenzualo. Tenzualo, democracy's child, grew up in a society that was worlds apart from the South Africa of her parents, South Africa of her grandparents and great-grandparents. She grew up in a society governed by a constitution, a constitution rooted in equality, the rule of law, and affirmation of the inherent dignity of every citizen. So President Ramaphosa's story of Dinzualo was a story of a woman who was born in 1994 and the trajectory of her life up to this point. And he tried to paint this picture that Dinzualo represents the nation. And since Dinzualo's story is a positive story, the story of South Africa's journey since 1994 has been equally positive. Now, just to take a step back, the reason why this could be effective, and I'm going to get into why I think the story is so misleading just now. So, so strap in your seatbelt for that. But the reason why it's an effective story is... What President Ramaphosa did with the Dinzualo story is he, he made success the same thing as what the ANC has done over the last 30 years. So if you're successful, you owe your success to the ANC. So everybody who's been successful, and nobody wants to say I'm unsuccessful. Everyone who's been successful then links that success to the ANC and attributes the success to the ANC government over the last 30 years. So you saw people, many ANC people, but even others posting on social media, I'm a Dinzualo, I'm a success story. And of course, uh, what President Ramaphosa cleverly did was he linked one's own pers personal ambitions and one's own personal achievements with the story of the ANC. And he said those two things go together. If you have made a success of your life over any time over the last 30 years, that's because the ANC government helped you to make that success. So it was, a, it was an important and a, and a, and a clever um, strategy. However, I think the story of Dinzualo is completely misguided. And someone has to say this. I don't know why people are going along with a story that just completely flies in the face of South Africans' experiences, especially over the last five years. So let's take a look at the story of Dinzualo. So President Ramaphosa says, the story of the first 30 years of our democracy can best be told through the life of Dinzualo, born at the dawn of freedom. Dinzualo, democracy's child, grew up in a society that was worlds apart from the South Africa of her parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. Let's stop there. Is democratic South Africa worlds apart from its apartheid predecessor? I'm not so sure, actually. Uh, th this is the subject of my book, The New Apartheid, but have we eradicated the kind of spatial patterns of apartheid where black people live in certain areas and white people live in other areas? Yes, we've tinkered around the margins, but those patterns are still very much with us. Have we dealt with the deep inequalities, especially racial inequalities, which exist in our economy? I'm not so sure. So... Politically speaking, rights have been conferred, but worlds apart papers over a lot of the economic continuities that we have seen between 1994 and the period before that. 
So she grew up in a, go- a country governed by a constitution rooted in equality, the rule of law, and affirmation of the inherent dignity of every citizen. True. But the constitution was passed in 1996. Are we really going to reward a party in 2024 for a constitution that was already drafted in 1996? Why would that matter for this particular election that we still have a constitution? Dean Swallow was born at the same time, um, many were born at the same time as her, were beneficiaries of the first policies of the democratic state to provide free health care for pe- pregnant women and children under the age of six. That's good and that's true. It's good that South Africa provides and it's true that South Africa does provide uh, free health care for pregnant women and children under the age of six in theory. However, take a look at the state of public hospitals in South Africa. Take a look at our shocking rate of maternal mortality, which is around 110, 120 per 100,000 live births, which is terrible and uh, an indictment on a country 30 years into democracy where we should get those numbers of maternal deaths during live birth way down into 10% of that. You look at the shortage of doctors in public hospitals, you look at the decaying infrastructure in public hospitals, you look at the images that we've sometimes seen of rats running around public hospitals, you look at corruption that has happened in the healthcare sector where skinny genes were bought for public hospitals rather than being diverted to doctors, nurses, administrators and other healthcare practitioners. You look at the delay times, the waiting times, you look at the quality of healthcare, which is often diminished by the fact that we don't have enough doctors in public healthcare institutions. And only just last week, we found out that there were a whole host of doctors who are ready to serve in the public healthcare, healthcare system, want to serve public hospitals, but the state doesn't have the money to pay them. So before we celebrate too vigorously, we need to look at the true reality of South Africa as we face it now, not just the gains we've made since 1994. Dinswala was enrolled in a school which her parents did not have to pay school fees. That's good and that's true. And each school day she received nutritious meals as part of a program that today supports 9 million learners from poor families. Excellent, important gains. I think the school uh, feeding scheme was a Mandela proposal which has expanded and and grown over time however what is not mentioned in this is the state of school infrastructure in south africa the fact that many people uh, uh many south african schools still have pit latrines where not one not two but three students have died in the last 10 years falling into them the fact that our school outcomes in terms of being able to read for meaning, are still amongst the worst in the world. So it's all well and good to have made some gains, but we can't talk about those gains without talking about the way in which our basic education system has failed spectacularly to bring tens of millions of people out of poverty like it really should. The democratic state provided child support grants, which is good to meet her basic needs, This grant, together with other forms of social assistance, continues to be a lifeline for more than 26 million South Africans every month. Here I will say the ANC government deserves credit for the social grant system in South Africa. Because without it, can you imagine how much more poverty and how much more desperation and how much more difficulty there would be in South Africa? Now the fact that we need this grant system and we haven't built an economy in which there are pathways to success outside of social grants enough to create a stable social and economic climate is in some ways an indictment. Others would say the fact that we haven't expanded the system beyond just the absolute basic necessities of life towards a more stable form of universal basic income is also an indictment. So the social welfare net is an important gain in the last 30 years. But once again, we've had this since 1994. I suppose President Ramaphosa could say that the social state or social relief distress grant, um, I forget the exact terminology, of 350, he Im- implemented in COVID and he has preserved it. But 
to what extent does that really, really change the fundamental lived reality of South Africans? Uh, I would argue not enough, given the state of the crisis that our economy is in. But this is where it gets a bit tough. Um, because we're told that Dinzualo grew up in a household provided with basic water and electricity throughout her, her, her life, I guess. But um, electricity. Do I need to start talking about electricity? Um, the ANC did a great job in expanding electricity in the first 10 to 15 years of democracy, and that was a really important gain. But we know since 2008 that there have been intermittent bouts of load shedding so that we gave electricity to a whole new lot of households and then we started taking it away periodically. In his 2023 SONA last year, President Ramaphosa announced the Minister of Electricity and promised that we were on track to deal a decisive blow to load shedding. And we know that, I mean, I was, I was back in, in December with my family that lives in the rural Eastern Cape. People have, I'm not even going to talk about water shedding. Or, there's no shedding. There's just no water. And people have given up hoping and expecting to ever get water back into running water back again. They don't know when it left and they f forgot when they st stopped hoping that it would come back. So the fact of the matter is that if we're going to talk about water and electricity, we don't have anything to celebrate as a country right now because every single citizen is affected by load shedding. Every single citizen is affected by the water cuts that, that, that cut across South Africa. And I have a simple question to ask. When was the last time you had one week of uninterrupted water and electricity at the same time? It's a scary question. When was the last one week period you remember in your, in your time in South Africa when you had water and electricity at the same time for a week? I actually can't remember when it was for me. Um, can you remember when it was for you? Because we've had load shedding for, I don't even know how long now, like just load shedding consistently. But then when load shedding stops, water comes in. And then sometimes you don't have water and electricity, but both together for a week. So how is it that 30 years into democracy, we still can't provide, I'm not asking for a year here. I'm not asking for a month. I'm asking for one week of uninterrupted electricity and water. We still don't have that. I could go on, but really, I just wanted to demonstrate how much the story of Dinsualo papers over. It papers over a series of cracks that I think it's actually quite insulting to paper over, to actually tell people that things are better for them than their own eyes can really see. So you create a fictional character to present a story of success when the lived reality doesn't paint the same picture. And of course, that there's, there's that time aspect to it as well. So that's my take on the story of Dinsualo. Uh, let's move on to the, uh, the next issue and that in this election, and that is load shedding. Thanks for watching SMWX. Before we get back to the episode, I just wanted to let you know the four ways that you can help support this channel if you want to see us growing bigger and better to keep you more entertained and informed. The first way is you can invite me to speak at your company, your school, your institution. You'll see the contact details down below. The second way is that you can become a member of this channel. Become a member or you can give us a thanks. You'll see there's like a heart with a dollar sign in the ribbon below this video. Buy me and the team some coffee for this episode. The third way you can get involved is you can advertise on the channel. Now, I'd much rather the community of viewers would be advertisers on this channel than me going out to people who don't really know about SMWX and trying to explain it to them. So if you're a viewer and you have a business and you want to partner and you love this platform, let's partner on this channel. And then finally, you can buy merchandise, you can buy books, 
All this is in the description down below. Now let's get back to the episode. No sooner had President Ramaphosa finished his State of the Nation address than we were met with an interesting message. Stage 4 load shedding. Oh, no, we meant, sorry, stage 6. Now, during his State of the Nation, one of the other things President Ramaphosa promised was that the end of load shedding was in reach. Now, the reason why I think the stage six load shedding right now that we are probably sitting through, or maybe now it's gone to stage four for you, depending on when this comes out. We've had load shedding before, and we are used to load shedding by now as South Africans. But it seemed like things were getting better. So we had the Minister of Electricity... We had those terrible stage six months and, and, and then slowly but surely it was stage four and then stage three, then stage two, three, one, three, and that's kind of how we've been living. We had a good December, uh, but that's when demand is at its lowest. But you did get the feeling, or at least we kept telling ourselves that maybe like we'll never go back to those terrible days of stage six. When you look at your phone and you see the app showing you those bars and then the bars are like for the whole day basically so the reason this one hit so hard is out of nowhere we're now back at the worst case scenario and you start to wonder what's worrying about this is how government wasn't able to predict this so the sona happens president ramaphosa says we've we've seen the worst so they were confident so if government is confident and they don't know that we could go into stage six the next day, then how are we supposed to be confident that we can escape stage six? We've heard stories um, uh, coming out about allegations of sabotage. I'm afraid I don't take these very seriously. Um, there have been so many different excuses for load shedding. Remember when workers were blamed? There was a period when it was, no, it was because of protests and workers were protesting. And then there was a period where it was uh, sabotage again. And then the military was apparently sent to ESCOM. And we just haven't figured out the power crisis in South Africa. I, I don't believe the sabotage story unless massive evidence is brought, brought forward. But let me, let's get this straight. If there is sabotage, What's worse, the fact that we can't protect our power system from sabotage or that we have load shedding? Because that's what a state and a government is supposed to do. It's supposed to have intelligence, it has an, a military, it has a police force, and it has to protect its citizens against people who would sabotage crucial public infrastructure. So I'm even more worried if it's sabotage, because then it means we can't keep the lights on and we also don't know when people are trying to sabotage our economy and we can't stop them. So I hope it's not sabotage because that means that the, sto the, 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 the inadequacies that this points out to are even deeper than we thought they were before. I just think it's a distraction from the obvious failure to govern and throwing out sabotage is a way to muddy the waters and make an excuse for the fact that load shedding is still so bad and still with us. Now, Minister Ramohopa, who I've interviewed before, you, you may have seen that, that viral clip where I asked him when load shedding is going to end and he doesn't give an answer, but he says he thinks they're going to have sufficient megawatts in place to really change the picture by December 2023, so last year. That's another reason. When a minister says by December 2023, we're confident we're going to be in a different place, he didn't say load shedding would end, but he was like, we're going to have a lot of megawatts by then. Now it's Feb and we're back to stage six. So the reason this matters for the election is that the worse load shedding gets, the worse it's going to be for the ANC. So we've done some analysis of polls here and we'll do uh, one in the next section of this video. But the Social Research Foundation has done some work looking at the correlation between load shedding and ANC performance. And basically what they have found is that the situation this year 
in terms of load shedding is going to have an important bearing on ANC electoral performance, which makes sense, right? The ANC's government, if government delivers load shedding, people are more likely to vote against the government because they are in load shedding. Whereas if load shedding gets better and better, people start thinking, oh, the government is fixing this, therefore they should be rewarded for that. So I'm actually a bit shocked as well that so close to an election, which could be in like three months' time, if it's in May, we're still in stage six. I would have thought by now, even just for purely electoral reasons, the ANC would have load shedding a bit more under control and not let it get to these terrible levels. So I think this has an interesting bearing on 2024 because this moment is going to be in the minds of voters when they go into the polling booths. Unlike kind of stage six last year, which we've already kind of forgotten about and we've moved on with our lives, but the closer to the election bad load shedding is, the worse that becomes. And the other question I have is like, are we ready for the election load shedding wise? We we can't have load shedding like in the week before the election or the week after the election, just from a pure like administrative perspective in this election, like ballot boxes and, you know, lights have to be on and, uh, you know, so... What does this mean about the readiness of the country? And are we ready for a load-shedding election itself? Uh, and what would that mean? So that's stage six, and I think it's an important thing to reflect on, and it's an important thing to to hold the powerful accountable for, because it affects everyone's life, including Dinsualo, that we are now in stage six load-shedding. Okay, let's come on to the third part of this analysis in the final part, and that is a look at the recent election polls. What's happening with polls? The last time we did this, and go and check out that video, which will be in a card somewhere uh, in this video, Um, there's a playlist called Analysis. You can go and look at all the analysis videos we've done. The last time we looked at the polls, we looked at the average of a number of different polls that had come out. And the ANC was sitting at around 43, if if memory serves correct, in that average. So we've had one more poll from Ipsos, which is a reputable polling firm. And if you haven't watched the other videos about polling, let me just say this. The polls, especially this far back, will never be exactly right. It's not a prediction of the election. But what the polls do is they help you to understand what is the ballpark of potential options. So like if Ipsos says the ANC is going to be at 50%, they're not going to be at 60. They're not going to be at 40. They're going to be at like 52 or 48 or somewhere around there. But they're not going to be like at 70 or 30. So you you can get an understanding of the ballpark of where we're heading in this election. Now, what did this recent Ipsos poll say? And it's important for us to really think about this because... This is about the future of the country for the next five years. If, if these polling numbers are anything near accurate, we need to really reflect on them. So here we go. Ipsos has, in terms of the medium-term voter turnout scenario, based on the recent numbers of election registration figures, by the way, well done, South Africans. 1.2 million new people are registered to vote which is the biggest increase in the voters' role since, I think, 2014. So it's a 10-year high in terms of the number of people who've registered to vote. So that's that's good news. Um, and watch our video about the elections, by the way. Uh, we spoke to the IEC. Go check that out. So we now have 27.4 million voters in South Africa, more than ever before. Ipsos tells us that as of... So they conducted this poll, which was between... October and December last year, right? That's important. The ANC, in the Ipsos poll, and then after this, I'm going to do an average of the Ipsos polls to to close us out. The ANC is sitting at 45%. The DA is sitting at 20%. 21, somewhere between those two. The EFF is at 18. And then you've got IFP 5 
action SA4, and then the others make up the rest. Now, what I also tend to do is I just look at a, a bit of a rolling average. So I look at from April last year to April this year, all the polls from Ipsos that have come out. What's the average? Because, you know, things go up, they, they fluctuate up and down sometimes. But if you can get the average, you kind of get uh, a sense of controlling for those fluctuations. Again, it's not a perfect science, but it's just an interesting thing to observe. If you look at the Ipsos, the three Ipsos polls now, the last three that have come out, the average for the ANC is 46, for the DA is 18, and for the EFF is 16, and IFP 5, Action SA 4. Again, so what does this tell us? Let's take a step back. So whether we look at that rolling average or whether we look at just the, the Ipsos number recently, ANC is sitting at below 50% as it consistently has been. So will the ANC get below 50? The polls are telling us probably right now, which would mean that would be the first time in democracy that the ANC has never got a majority of the vote. The DA right now is looking like it's staying relatively stagnant. It's not growing a lot, but it's also not losing a lot of support. So at around its 20% mark, that's where the DA is right now. If it were to go down to 18, that would be a, a, a loss. If it were to go up to 22, 23, that would be an improvement. But we're not going to see the DA at 30 or anything like that, um, judging by these polling numbers. Now, the EFF in the latest Ipsos poll sitting at 18 means it's now within reach of the DA. So I think one of the interesting lines in this election is, who's going to be the official opposition? It still looks like it's going to be the DA. But what we could see is a much closer uh, two opposition parties vying to be that official opposition party. And if the DA slips up or makes any major mistakes in this election, the EFF will be ready to pounce. But can the EFF really keep up that growth trajectory? Because remember, it's only on 10 after the last election. So to go to 18 would be like a massive, massive jump. 15 would even be a good performance. So the average of the Ipsos polls up to now is 16. Um, so that'll be an interesting plot line to watch. What I'm interested in is the IFP at five, which would be a growth for the IFP. And if you add ANC plus IFP, you probably get over 50% right now. So that's an interesting coalition possibility. Action SA at four. So of all the newcomers, I know Action SA was there in the local government elections, but they had just been formed. You've got Action SA, Rise, Borsa, Chiluva. Um, am I leaving any newcomers out? Those are just some of the newcomers. Um, we'll get to MK later. Action SA looks like the biggest of the new party. The Patriotic Alliance is another one. Action SA looks like the biggest, coming in at 4%, which would be Quite an impressive showing for a party in its first national elections. 4% is not child's play. Um, elections are, are really hard. So Action SA plus the DA could be something like 24, 25%, which would be about a quarter of the electorate. Now, the interesting thing about this poll as we, as we round off is that it was taken before the announcement of former President Zuma's MK party. So we know that the ANC is already sitting at 45, 46 before MK even comes into the picture. So what's going to be really interesting when the newer polls come out is what effect will MK have on these different parties? Is it going to take away from the ANC? As I think it probably will because former President Zuma comes from the ANC. Is it going to take away from the EFF? Because the EFF is seen as a challenger to the ANC within the kind of liberation movement tradition. Could MK eat into EFF votes and actually bring the EFF back closer to 15 rather than closer to 20 or even below 15 as, as it moves forward? And, and how many, what percentage is MK getting at? I think I said 1 or 2% would be interesting for me. Could the MK push 3 to 4%? We saw some recent KZN by-elections, which are, you know, very small samples and, and not representative of the country. 
But in KZN, in those by-elections, MK was able to have a very impressive showing very soon after its launch. And we can see that on the ground, MK is gaining some traction. So what would it mean if the NC came even further below 45? What would it mean? Uh, I don't think it threatens the DA much because I doubt that MK voters are ever likely to vote for the DA. But I think within the ANC and the EFF, it'll be interesting to see what effect MK will have on those two parties and their vote shares. So this has been an election update. In these videos, we tried to tell you what are the most important recent things that have happened. We analyze them. I give you my opinion on a few different things, but remember, I'm not always right. This is not a channel where you have to agree with me or believe everything I say. This is just a channel where we try to create debate, spark discussion about the issues that matter to us. Do you think Dinsualo's story is actually compelling? Am I overlooking some of the important gains that have been made even in the last five years of ANC government? What about load shedding stage six? What are your thoughts? How did it hit you? How did you feel? What are you doing to try and overcome load shedding stage six? What about the polls? What do you think of them? Do you have your own election predictions? Put them down below, whether you support the DA, MK. Are you a DA, MK voter? Maybe such a thing exists. One day you're going to vote for the DA. Now you decided you're going to vote MK. If you are, comment down below. And let's have a conversation going into one of our country's most important elections. Like because that helps build the channel, share, that helps grow the channel, subscribe, that expands the channel, and keep it locked on SMWX. This is where you want to be this election. Aye, aye.